Welcome to another lecture by Medical Medics, Learning Made Easy. Physiology, Chapter 1, Introduction to Physiology and Homeostasis. So in this first lecture, we will give you a brief introduction into the subject of physiology, discuss the levels of organization in the body, present the concept of homeostasis, discuss different components and examples of it, and what happens when the systems are disrupted. And we will discuss the continuous nature of physiology and end with a summary. Now, what is physiology? So physiology is the study of how living organisms function. It focuses on understanding mechanisms, so how the body works at every level. An example can be physiology of the heart explains how the heart pumps blood efficiently to sustain life. So physiology is like a blueprint that explains how everything in the body works together. Levels of organization in the body. So let's start at the chemical level where we have atoms or atoms and molecules like water and proteins. This is illustrated right here. Building on that, we have at the cellular level, where we find the basic units of life, like nerve cells, cardiac cells, and any other cell. After that, we reach the tissue level, so groups of cells working together, like muscle tissue. Continuing from that, we get to the organ level, where tissues form functional units, for example, the lungs. Continuing, we get to the system level where organs performing collective functions. So for example, we have the respiratory system. And continuing on, we get to the organism level, so the body as a whole. So homeostasis is the body's ability to maintain a stable internal environment despite external changes. Some examples of regulated variables include body temperature, blood pH, glucose levels in the blood, and this ensures survival and optimal functioning. So homeostasis is like being on cruise control. It keeps your body steady no matter what is going on around you. Now, what are some components of homeostasis? Well, the key components include sensors that detect changes in the environment. For example, thermoreceptors for changes in temperature. We have the control center processing information and determining responses like our brain. Effectors, which act to restore balance, for example, our muscles or our glands. Furthermore, we have something called the negative feedback loop and the positive feedback loop. Now, negative feedback loops reverse changes to maintain stability. So, as, just as a simple example, we have, for whatever reason, an increase in our blood pressure. There are systems in place where we get alerted or our body gets alerted to the fact that blood pressure has arisen. So it sets into motion changes to reverse this to reach a stable level. Obviously, when the natural, uh, these natural feedback loops don't function as they're supposed to, this is when we can start talking about the development of pathologies. So we might need to assist the patient with medication, for example. We also have positive feedback loops, and these amplify changes for specific outcomes. For example, during childbirth, we want contractions to occur. Now let's look at an example of homeostasis. Let's take body temperature. So the scenario is, the body temperature is rising during exercise, right? Exercise is not a pathology, but our body temperature is increasing during exercise. 
What's the response then? Well, we have sensors detecting this rise in temperature. Our brain activates our sweat glands. Sweating then cools the body through evaporation. And the outcome? Our body temperature returns to normal. This is a great example of how it's supposed to maintain homeostasis. Just to give you a little clinical in insight here, we, told, we went through that this is during exercise, so this is a normal procedure in day-to-day -day life, let's say. But what if body temperature has risen and keeps rising due to an infection? You have probably at least once in your life experienced having fever. And if we have an infection, fever might occur. Now, if that fever keeps increasing to certain levels where uh, the environment that becomes created due to this high elevation of temperature becomes uh, incredibly destabilizing for us and could, could lead to failure of organs and eventually even death. So what do we do then? Well, we use, for example, antipyretics. So medication to decrease this fever. One you may know of is, for example, paracetamol or paracetamol. So in that case, we have an infection, right? Maybe it's spreading. Maybe it's a serious infection. Our body is not able to maintain its homeostasis. So this is when your job as a doctor comes in. And you identify that the body is not maintaining homeostasis. This fever is elevating the body temperature way too, too high. It's becoming deadly. So let me give a medication to help decrease this fever while also treating this infection with antibiotics or whatever it may be. Now, what happens then when this this balance of homeostasis actually fails. So disruptions of homeostasis leads to disease or dysfunction. For example, diabetes. That's a failure to regulate blood glucose levels. A heat stroke is the inability to regulate the temperature. So restoring homeostasis is the aim of medical interventions. To understand diseases, we must first master physiology's role in maintaining balance. Because remember, just like when we went through anatomy or studied anatomy, you learned, first of all, the anatomical position or the anatomic position. And then you reference everything else to that. So you have a reference point so you don't get lost. It's the same here. We start with homeostasis. What is the normal? And when you go to the doctor, you take some blood tests. There is always some ranges you are given. And if it's above that range, there is a mark usually, or, or if it's below that. These ranges somehow indicate homeostasis in a way. And when whatever value deviates from that, there is a disruption probably due to some disease or dysfunction at some level. Now, physiology and clinical practice. So what are some clinical applications of physiology? For example, blood pressure monitoring ensures cardiovascular homeostasis. Blood sugar tests evaluate for glucose regulation. Ventilation adjustments in critical care help maintain oxygen balance. Now, physiology is dynamic, so the body continuously adapts to internal and external changes. Systems are interdependent, so changes in one system very often affect syst other systems. For example, stress activates the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the cardiovascular system. So in summary then, physiology explains how the body functions and stays balanced. Homeostasis is critical for health. Disruptions lead to disease. Understanding physiology is essential for diagnosing and treating illnesses. 
And that's the end of our first chapter. Continue now to chapter two.